This is episode number 52, featuring artist Michael Orwick and an amazing plein air adventure unlike any ever done in the world. Welcome to the Plen Air Podcast from Plen Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. In the Plen Air Podcast, we dive into the world of outdoor painting called Plen Air Painting. For those of you who don't know, Plen Air is a French term essentially meaning in the open air or outdoors. The French say Plen Air, others say Plain Air, but no matter how you say it, there's a huge movement of artists around the world going outdoors to paint, and this show is about that movement. The podcast is brought to you by my event called Fall Color Week, which is my painter's retreat at Acadia National Park in Maine during the peak week of fall color. It's all about painting every day with friends, lots of scenery, uh, not only amazing color, but coastal scenes, giant rocky cliffs, beautiful harbors, lobster boats, lighthouses, And it's not workshops, it's just painting together and we have a lot of fun and you really ramp up your painting after a week of painting. Most of us won't do a week of two or three paintings a day for a week. Uh, So if you need the time, you want to get the brush time, you want to get away from your your busy lives, come up to the retreat Fall Color Week. It's at fallcolorweek.com. It's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting and you can help by sharing this podcast with your friends share it on social media or email and I hope you'll subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week and of course we'd love for you to give us a comment or a rating and your feedback is always helpful eric at plenairmagazine.com that's p-l-e-i-n air a-i-r magazine.com today's interview is also brought to you by easel brush clip the cool tool to hold your brushes that clips on your easel so they're not always falling on the ground I didn't have mine the other day, and they were falling on the ground. I got a bunch of mud in my brushes. It was a hassle. So learn more at easelbrushclip.com. Well, let's get right to our interview with Michael Orwick. Today, we're honored to have painter Michael Orwick. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure. So I uh, wanted to talk to you because you've done some really interesting things in your life, uh, including a phenomenal uh, adventure, which we're going to get into a few minutes. But first off, let's kind of start out with your career. Um, When did you start uh, picking up a paintbrush? Well, I've always been drawing and painting actually came a bit later, actually at the end of college. So that was approximately, what, 16, 17 years ago. I actually went into college for illustration and animation which I think a lot of painters have that background and it's a nice foundation. And basically really started to play with paints and experiment as a way to uh, do my illustrations bigger and uh, faster. And I was lucky enough to pick up a gallery actually with my illustration work, some of it. And when they saw some of the personal work I was doing based on uh, camping and travels and things like that. They asked if they could show that. And that just happened to me, some of my plein air and, uh, landscape work. And the, the show was actually a success right away. And, uh, I was able to wean myself off illustration work and, uh, continued to do what I actually really loved and kind of what I thought I would be doing as a retirement plan, painting, you know, trails and creeks and all the beautiful things out here in Oregon. And so I feel very lucky, kind of got to jump past a lot of years and uh, do what I love right away. So I, I want to probe that just a little bit because I think sure. it's curious. Uh, so you had a plan that uh, one day you would morph out of the illustration world and you were working full time as an illustrator? Uh, full-time in restaurants and illustration. I never was able to make a full-time illustration job. So I worked in restaurants for about eight years through college and into the beginning of my art career. And were you suppl- were you supplementing by waiting tables? Were you uh, cooking? Ex- exactly right. Started off as a cook. Actually started off as a dishwasher, cook, and then into waiting tables and eventually some bartending work. 
And uh, it was nice. You know, it was a great way to, like, like you said, supplement things. I always felt like I was an artist, but it's hard to make that initial jump right out of school. So I was lucky to get, you know, small jobs and I was doing murals for restaurants and uh, lots of things like that. So, so as have- I, yeah, so- as I got more work, I, and illustration and then in the galleries, I just worked less at the restaurant until eventually one took over the other. And then eventually, though, you had in the back of your mind that you were going to retire someday and become a full-time painter. So you you didn't have this uh, dream or belief that you could do it sooner than that, or uh, was that part of the, the plan ultimately? You know what? The truth was I didn't hate illustration. I, you know, I liked it a lot and I felt like, you know, a lot of my uh, heroes growing up were the famous illustrators and I just kind of felt like it was part of the same beast in a way. And it was only in working in illustration and animation for a while that I realized that they were so different that, you know, if I wanted to have my own voice and make my own creations, that it had to be independent of these companies. And so I guess maybe out of vanity or ego, I really <laughs> I really enjoyed being the sole person behind the creations. I still do, you know, some commission work and things like that, but I really do enjoy just walking into the studio and or outdoors and saying, okay, what inspires me today? So what, what do I the- want to work on? What was the first time that you uh, you actually went outdoors and painted? What and and what triggered that? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. It's I've heard this said by some of your other guests, and you know, talking to some of my friends, that the tr- I just didn't know that it was a thing. You just kind of when I started painting, I just went outside, and I really enjoyed painting when I was camping and painting. You know, when my buddies would be fishing. Um, so I just didn't really know that it was a different thing. Um, so I've always enjoyed it. I've, you know, just like my buddies when they're out there fishing and not catching anything, it's still a great day of fishing. Even if your paintings don't work out, it's still a great day of just being outside and enjoying nature and painting. So it's always kind of been there. So and now you, it's so much more organized and the equipment is so much better. <laughs> so it's great. So you, um, you, you you got a lucky patch, right? You got you got invited into a gallery for some some of your illustration work, and then for some of your your other paintings. Uh, were you then able to essentially make the switch and become a full time painter? Yes, um, at basically, it was right around when my daughter was born. She's now twelve years old. Um, I was you know, working in the bars and restaurants, getting home at about three in the morning after closing them down at two 30. And my wife was getting up at, you know, six. And so there was a lot of, um, just missing the family element. And so when my daughter was born, I went into work and just happened chance that there was a new manager and I hadn't been working very much because of the art jobs. And he looked at me and he's like, do you work here? And I actually said, no, I don't think I do. And it was a really nice feeling just to go home and wake my wife up and go, yeah, I think I quit my job. (laughs) And she was very, very supportive. Um, It was nerve wracking, but I think that, you know, sink or swim mentality and having that, you know, beautiful little baby and uh, support of my wife really helped things go along. There's, you know, definitely been ups and downs and everything else that goes with the art career, but I've been really fortunate. Well, sometimes there's value in burning the bridges behind you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, um, you, you have this phenomenal story, uh, an adventure. Will you tell us about this adventure? Uh, first off, tell us about how it came about, and then tell us the outcome. Tell us about the, the, the trip itself. Yeah, I would love to. Um, my wife is from Bulgaria, and I grew up traveling some, and so it's always been this mutual thing between us that we love. And even, you know, as my daughter's been growing up, we've continued to travel at least about once a year for a couple of weeks. And I guess that slowly the idea began to brew of taking a year off, 
We started reading books, uh, Vagabonding, one of my favorites, that really just kind of inspired me. And it was, yeah, it was an interesting thing. It just slowly, slowly brewed in the back of our minds. And my daughter was, I think, 10. And she was a, just a great traveler. And she was also beginning to paint. And uh, she started getting some art shows. And we were, you know, it was just for fun. And we were donating large portions of the proceeds to different causes that our family believed in, like the Children's Healing Art Project and different uh, wildlife uh, rescue things. And it was an interesting, as we, again, continued to explore the idea of what if we really just took a year off and did homeschooling, which we eventually called travel schooling. And combined it with our love of philanthropy and my our love of art. And somehow that connection made everything so much more tangible and just beyond ourselves. I guess because a lot of time when you're thinking about a big trip like that, it really felt like taking a year of vacation. And that was exciting and fun, but it wasn't realistic or grounded, I guess. And so when we threw in the idea of philanthropy, and we didn't quite have a firm idea of what that was going to be, uh, it, everything started to slowly fall into place. So then we came up with the idea of studio everywhere, and that's kind of our little foundation or whatever you want to call it, um, what we named it. And we decided to go and paint with children, uh, less fortunate children, children in orphanages and different schools <laughs> and things like that, raise a bunch of money, talk to the different art companies that I work with ask for donations. We set up a little um, a site for people to help back us and that where they could follow along on our adventures. And we raised about $5,000, I think. And every single one of the, you know, every dollar went only towards the art. Nothing was about our travel or anything else. We um, were able to find inexpensive ways to travel, people to stay with. And we were, it was amazing. We ended up going to 21 different countries, if we include the Vatican and painted with well over 500 children uh, in a number of different orphanages. And uh, we did kind of one large art project that was all based on self-portraits, but very, very loosely. <laughs> they could paint basically how they saw themselves. And we just thought it would be such an amazing thing to see, you know, almost like a science experiment. Do kids in different parts of the world see themselves differently? Do they use different colors? Do they, uh, you know, all these different things we were very curious about. And, um, so yeah, it really, as soon as that idea came together, it was amazing. It was as if we could almost not, we couldn't have stopped the momentum if we would have wanted to. It was, you know, one person popping up out of the woodwork out of an after another like if you come here stay with us if you come here stay with us and you know please come to my school and work with my kids or come to this orphanage and it was fantastic but it was really like a giant snowball just gathering momentum well that uh, talk about a, a a bold proposition i mean that's that's remarkable so you um you obviously had to figure out how how you were going to pay for your own expenses of your travel and, uh, you know, even though you were staying with people and you probably had that all very well orchestrated, I'm sure you had a lot of expense attached to this trip. How did you do that? Yeah, then that's definitely the frightening thing as you look down long term at something like this. But amazingly, it was actually cheaper to live on the road, including airfare and everything else, than it was to live here in the States, um, which seems unbelievable. But we only stayed in probably about three or four hotels the entire year. We stayed with people either that we knew or that we met on the road a huge portion of the time. And then Airbnb was a real godsend in a lot of places, uh, really inexpensive. So that was a huge part. We were able to rent out our home for exactly the right amount of time. So, I mean, it was like I was saying, the serendipity of things just falling into place. Um, we've always lived fairly frugally. We, you know, pay off our cars really quickly. We, we, we're not really into a lot of things. We're definitely into experiences. So it, you know, fit in with our, our uh, lifestyle very well. And yeah, we booked about half of the flights the first half of the trip 
at the beginning and found a company that was able to kind of make everything link up and the prices were really, really affordable. And then once you get into Asia, the flights were as low as like $28 per person hmm. to go to other countries from within Asia. So we were able to pick like hub countries. So Thailand is the hub for Asia. And basically you just keep landing back in Thailand and then going off to another country. And it was amazing. And then the same thing, we were really lucky when we got to Europe that flights, it was cheaper to fly in Europe than to take the train. Really? So yeah, it was really, really interesting. And, uh, yeah, I, we've been very fortunate. And with Facebook and everything else, it was amazing how many, you know, friends and family and, you know, barely even acquaintances would just kind of pop up and say, if you're going to be in the area, we would love to host you and, uh, you know, love to paint with you, love to, you know, have our kids paint with you, your kids and our kid and at our school. So, again, things just kept happening. And we were amazed. We would, like, uh, on a boat in Southeast Asia, we met a family that ended up, you know, only met them for like an hour. And they just were, when you come to Switzerland, and we were like, we're not going to Switzerland. It's too expensive. They're like, well, don't worry. Come to Switzerland and we'll take care of you. And they were fantastic. And things like that, same thing happened uh, in Germany and a lot of different countries. So I think the goodwill and the story and the fact that we had a, you know, a little uh, girl with us and my wife's an amazing uh, speaker and really a friendly, outgoing person. It was great. So by the end of the last third of the trip, we really were just kind of going by the seat of our pants. And it was – everything worked out. We had – in that whole entire year, besides a couple flat tires and broken down vehicles and you know maybe getting lost a little bit, nothing bad happened. We were never scared for our lives except for maybe in traffic in India and stuff like that. But uh, it was a fantastic trip. It was really uh, – it really just made the wonderfulness of humanity uh, really sink in in a profound way. What a fabulous story. And, and uh, I assume you're going to do a book? We are doing a book right now based on the children's work. And that will probably be just kind of for us. And then we'd love to send back to all the different locations that we did the project and say, look, here's all the all the work put together in one thing and just to, so they have that comparison i mean it was so amazing the differences and the similarities between you know all the kids work all over the world and so that was you know i'm excited to see that and then we'll also be putting together i'm doing a traveling show based on our travels starting in august and so i'm hoping to put together uh, books based on that with, you know, photos and the paintings that I did, the plein air work that I did, and then also the finished studio work based on all of those experiences. Well, Michael, so, um, how about we put you on stage and do an hour travelogue at the plein air convention at, in Santa Fe? I would be very honored. All right, that would folks, be fantastic. You, heard, you heard it here first. <laughs> See, this is serendipity. These things just happen. I, I think this is remarkable, and I'd encourage you to do a book about the entire experience <clears throat> because I, I think that it's, it's a remarkable experience. Tell us a couple of the stories that uh, maybe some things that happened to you or your wife or your daughter on, on this trip. Yeah, I just, I mean, I go right back to the first country, Costa Rica, and, you know, just that we thought Costa Rica would be just such a wonderful stepping stone. You know, it's an easy country to travel to. It's beautiful. Everything's pretty uh, laid out. But it was amazing, you know, just early on, the kind of bumps and learning what we didn't know and weren't prepared for. Um, so I would advise anybody that wants to do something like this to start off, you know, in a couple more uh, friendly, easy countries. Um, but just the whole getting lost a lot. And realizing that it wasn't a bad thing to get lost as long as, you know, you kind of had an idea where you were. And a lot of our best uh, best adventures happened when we kind of got off track a little bit. And so very early on in this Costa Rica trip, we came up with the motto, and I'm, I guess I shouldn't say came up with, but began to live by the motto of expectations kill experiences. And so that really just very quickly made us so we were so much more open 
to what was going to happen and what we were going to find, you know, in these little beautiful markets and little tiny towns and villages and uh, unexpected beaches and all of that. Um, some of our very, very best experiences, of course, were painting with the kids in the different orphanages. Um, and we did not set up ahead of time a real, you know, we did not call orphanages uh, way ahead of time, except for a couple. And it was interesting how difficult sometimes it was to find them. And a lot of times the people working at the orphanages don't speak much English. So there's always a language barrier. Um, and again, the language barrier was something that at the very beginning is very kind of a big stumbling block. Um, I actually don't speak any other languages. Luckily, my wife, wife speaks uh, quite a few. Um, but uh, the orphanages were amazing. So one of the very first, or actually the first orphanage we went to in Costa Rica, we just couldn't find it. Um, and we finally asked our little tiny Airbnb host about it, and she actually was friends with uh, one of the nuns that worked there and directed us. And we, she told us, you know, she's, they're not really happy to have um, guests all the time. But if you do these things, which was grab some snacks and some drinks and some food, you know, something that actually helps the orphanage beyond just entertaining and educating the kids. And so we showed up with a couple big box, cardboard boxes loaded up and then a couple boxes of art supplies. And they were just thrilled to have us. And we were planning to spend one hour. Um, all the nuns actually just kind of vanished and we were left with all the kids. And it was right at the foot of a very large semi-active volcano. And it was so interesting as my wife in her broken Spanish was trying to communicate, uh, you know, the idea of a self-portrait. And I drew a picture and, um, of myself and my daughter drew a picture of herself as kind of an example. And then all of the kids drew volcanoes. Every single child living in the shadow of this volcano drew a volcano with their face on it. And so that really kind of, again, that expectations versus experiences thing, we were very quickly like, oh, this is amazing. This is such a neat uh, thing that I would have never thought of that all these kids do. Um, and we did find that definitely the oldest kid will often be the most influential and the kids will kind of follow along. But maybe on the third and fourth and for some kids, if they stick around or stay interested, fifth paintings, then they really begin to get even more creative and more individualistic. So we learned that you don't push, you don't, you know, try to organize things too much. You just go with the flow. And it was amazing in some countries. Well, in Cambodia, almost out of 70 kids, I think only two drew their face. All the rest drew fruit. We don't know why. We don't know how, what was lost <laughs> in translation. You know, some of the fruit had faces on it. A lot of it did it. Um, but I mean, it was, and that was such an amazing experience. That whole, it was not an orphanage, but it was a school right on the edge of, um, of the uh, slums. And we actually lived right on the edge of the slums as well with uh, an amazing gentleman and his family. And we went into this school really, again, not knowing what to expect. He told us to buy art supplies for about 25 kids. Um, luckily, we always plan to um, donate a lot of supplies after we leave. And about 70 kids showed up, and they had one light bulb. <laughs> and so everybody just kind of gathered around. Unfortunately, there's no photos because the lighting was so bad, but that was such a fun experience. Um, yeah, almost all of our real, real highlights are from painting with the kids. So I'm there's curious, so many stories, yeah. I'm curious about uh, logistics because I'm thinking about, first off, you're going off for a year. Uh, yourself and your daughter, I don't know if your wife painted as well. But, she does not. Okay, so, but you, you're carrying your easels. Uh, you're carrying art supplies, panels. How do you come up with stuff for a year just for yourselves what do you do with the paintings when they're done, when they're wet, and you're moving on <laughs> to the next thing? And, and, and then you've got this issue of you're bringing gobs of art supplies to the students and, and yeah. the kids. Uh, so did you have the art companies drop ship things to you at various locations? How did that all work out? 
Yeah, these are really good questions. And these are the things that kept me up at night as we got closer and closer to our trip. Um, I work with uh, Gamblin Paints and uh, they've been fantastic. And they offered to donate a whole lot of paint and actually have it drop ship to the locations where they sell. And we talked about that a lot and uh, we were kind of ready to go, but I, I could never quite wrap my head around the fact of teaching a whole bunch of kids oil painting <laughs> in one shot um, and then leaving them a whole lot of tubes of oil paint. Uh, I know the struggles that I've had just, you know, getting my daughter from acrylics to oils and the mess and everything else. Um, so we decided against that. We decided against going with oils and thought maybe, you know, acrylics or temperas or something would be a better option. And so we worked with a couple of different ideas and then slowly began to realize that I don't want to go to these locations as a, you know, American and say here, you know, with me here and with these American art supplies or these European art supplies, you can paint. So we decided that it would be actually better to go and get our supplies from the area. And some area, you know, sometimes it was the most simple, basic supplies. And sometimes they actually had art, you know, art shops in, you know, maybe the city nearby. So we used the donations to buy those art supplies. And uh, I think that was a much better option and a much more realistic option, you know, because I just didn't want them to feel like, oh, that was a neat once in a lifetime experience. I wanted it to be replicable for them. Buying art supplies locally also became part of our adventure, trying to find the stores, trying to communicate, trying to get the supplies, you know, over if it was taxi or tuk-tuk or whatever device, a lot of times just carrying lots of heavy bags through the cities or towns or villages. And it, it just became such an ordeal, but a, a wonderful ordeal. We found that by shopping locally and forcing ourselves to use the art supplies that were available that it became part of the adventure for us. We, you know, had to find the stores, we had to buy the supplies, you know, the communication barriers again. But the main thing that we found for ourselves that was an advantage for us is that when traveling, it's very easy to follow the tourist circuit. It's very easy to get comfortable and stay either in your hotel or on the beach or any of these other things you know, only going to the museums and eating good food. So by doing this little adventure and forcing ourselves to get out and into the community, it really was fantastic. And we met, again, so many neat people by doing that. And we thought that it just made the whole art ordeal much more realistic when they realized, wait, I can do paintings on anything and I can paint with almost anything. And I think when we get the book and all the children's pictures put together, you're going to get to see some of that you know, that struggle uh, of what supplies to get and how to, you know, how to use them. Uh, like when we were in India, we went to a very, very rural school. We were invited to a wedding and we went out to this very small village, actually just a f bunch of farms. And one of the gentlemen there, the guy who was getting married, actually sponsors a very rural school. And it was really one of the highlights for us. But getting art supplies out there was just so much luck and so much hard work and so many people coming together kind of just, oh, here's some and here's some and here's some paper and here's some paper towels. And then we, again, we got to the school expecting about 30 children and we were greeted by about 70. And it was amazing without even being asked. These kids don't even have desks. Everybody's sitting on the ground. Um, only natural light as far as I can remember. I don't remember any light bulbs. It was quite dark. And we'd have little circles of about five kids. And they, without even being asked or even thinking about it, they would pass the paintbrush from person to person. They would tear their uh, napkins or their uh, paper towels in half. It was all about sharing and community. And we were there with my daughter and three of her good friends were actually able to join us in India and a number of other kids from the US all there for that wedding. And it was just the most amazing thing for all these children and for us as adults to see this 
uh, generosity between themselves and uh, uh, the artwork they turned out was beautiful. And uh, some of the kids really just hung out and you could tell we're just super excited to get to paint and have this opportunity. Cause I do believe that they never had in that school before. I mean, it was just, you know, bare necessities. So what, what do you think was the biggest lesson that you learned from this experience? Well, <laughs> that my family can get along in these little tiny, you know, together so close for so long. I was really a little bit nervous about that because all three of us have our own, our own lives and we are fairly independent and all creative and hardworking people. And the fact that we got smushed together, that was just so reassuring and uh, it made me really happy. Um, but the things I learned, the most important thing I think was that people are amazing that, you know, there's that whole mentality that, yeah, you were excited by what, the fact that you're excited and, you know, we can all together make something interesting and really fun. And it was amazing. So many places that we would stay, the Airbnbs or uh, home shares or different things like that, the people there would be like, oh, what? That's such a cool project. You know, let me tell this friend and this friend and, you know, down the line it would go. And, um, so I think that excitement is contagious and I think that, uh, happiness is contagious. And I think that, you know, despite what we hear and, uh, are told here you know, by the media and everything else that the world is beautiful and friendly and amazing, you know, and, and, so. what, and what about your daughter? What, what would she say if I asked her the same question? Huh, that is a great question, and I hope you get the opportunity. Um, she, I think, really realized that the communication barrier wasn't that much of a barrier. She made friends everywhere we went, um, you know, was invited to play. She loves soccer, so that's a very universal sport. Uh, played a lot of card games, and we really, I mean, we'd get invited to dinners and different things like that. Um, so I think, yeah, the fact that you can make friends even when you don't even speak the same language is uh, <laughs> pretty amazing. Um, the trip did get a tiny bit long for her towards the end. I think if we do something again, we'll probably do it in six-month bursts just because she really does have a great group of friends here and really did miss them. And she's really active in sports. Um, but she, yeah, she definitely came home a slightly different kid. She, you know, my friends and people we meet are always kind of telling us that she talks differently. She doesn't, you know, when she communicates with adults, doesn't communicate like your average child. And I think it is the fact that she's seen things and learned things and, you know, appreciates what she has and what America has on a different level than, you know, 99% of the children that live here. And I think that appreciation when we traveled, we actually traveled with only carry-on bags as well. That was uh, something I meant to bring up earlier. Oh, no, really? Yeah, and that's the part that I think almost most people are like, no, I <laughs> can't do that. Um, but, yeah, we really carried carry-on bags. And uh, so the only bag I had to check in was my paints. And that was a godsend just getting into you know subways and little taxi cars and tuk-tuks, which are little motorbike carts <laughs> and being able to fit into all these, you know, little places, little tiny hotel rooms or little tiny, you know, bedroom that we would get. Um, and it was amazing what, you know, two or three t-shirts and a pair of pants and a pair of shorts and, you know, one pair of shoes and one pair of flip flops and, you know, quick dry towels and everything was very versatile. Our coats became our pillows and sometimes our blankets and you know we had to carry our own sheets and pillows so it was amazing how small and compact and multifaceted everything could be um and i should be honest in this and tell you that how we did it was we took our uh we shipped cold clothing to europe so then we were able to uh transition and take, you know, have our warm clothes in South America, Central America, Southeast Asia. And uh, when we got to Europe, we had warm clothes waiting for us. So, and we just basically sent our warm clothes, a lot of our warm clothes back home. So you, also, uh, I'm curious, uh, 
One other piece of that question that I asked earlier is about your own painting, and that is that uh, aside from the things that you were doing with the orphanages and so on, were you also doing landscape paintings while you were out and about in these areas? Yeah, I was able to, I expected to do a lot. I'm always very optimistic and really I thought, oh, I'll do one every you know morning on the days we're not traveling, which didn't quite work out. I ended up bringing home, uh, I think about 40 paintings. Um, and yeah, it was fantastic. I, those were also some of my fondest memories of just getting that quiet time and, you know, just that time to just sit and ponder and look, you know, all plein air painters know that feeling, but when you're in a new country or a completely new landscape, it was, uh, really valuable for me. Um, so how I traveled was I took a limited palette. And I did take my gambling oils. Um, unfortunately, no paint thinner, which is what I use for both a medium or a thinner and for cleaning my brushes. So I had some uh, bumps in the road learning different tools and ways to paint. Um, and so some paintings dried way too slowly and different. You know, I was experimenting on the road. I would. I've definitely learned a lot and I could share that <laughs> with your uh, audience when I get on the stage, kind of a, what, what would I do differently? But um, I painted on paper. So I glued the uh, books of paper, um, I, the oil arches, oil paper. I glued the edges together to make bricks and I uh, just pulled them off with my palette knife one by one. And then I used the Raymar paint boxes to carry my wet paintings. And I used, I guess, is it okay to yeah. speak about all these uh, different? Sure, sure. Um, Yeah, these yeah. people deserve recognition for supporting yeah. them. Yeah, it's, yeah, everybody is amazing. Uh, Strata Easel would be one of my hats off to uh, Brian. Um, he gave my daughter a setup, which was just phenomenal. Um, and so she and I both had the little tiny Strata Easel. Well, now he's even got a smaller one that... It's amazing how well it hood up, uh, stood up. It's truly a bulletproof paint box. It's been around the world, and I still use it on all of my plein air things because I'm so used to it and like it so much. And what I did is because I really like a bigger palette, I actually cut a piece of plexiglass that fit within the uh, wet paint box holder. And so the wet palette covered in paint could go into the paint box holder, and so that was one of my inventions that I was really proud of. Um, and so, yeah, I was able to bring home quite a few paintings. I handed out a lots, lots of them as gifts and a lot of them just didn't quite make it or I didn't feel like they were successful enough to bother carrying. Uh, that's the nice thing about painting on paper, just toss them away. <laughs> so yeah, I'm actually in the process of framing up some of those for, uh, the, my travel show that'll be coming up and figuring out which ones are going to be not for sale that I would really like to just keep as mementos. Um, that was the other thing when you travel with only carry on bags is you buy nothing. <laughs> we came home with about three trinkets each. And, um, that was, so our memories are based on the experience and the photos and the paintings and, uh, these relationships, these new relationships we have with our friends. So, well, you brought home a lifetime of memories. You, you've done something that I think most of us uh, look at and say, this is probably not something most of us would ever do in our lifetimes. It's pretty amazing that you pulled that off and you did it beautifully. And, and, and to have the, the aspect of the orphanages with it is remarkable. So uh, I think you, you, have, um, you, know, you, you have the subjects for a book, you have subjects for a movie, you have... This is something that, that could turn into um, uh, a, a real wonderful documentary, a lifetime of, of painting uh, surrounded by this event. So that's, that's really remarkable. And I think that um, people will be interested in seeing the photos and seeing the books and seeing the, the various, the paintings and so on that you've done from this trip. So congratulations. Thank you so much. It was really fun to get to talk about it. But I have to say one thing. When people tell us, oh, that was, you know, the trip of a lifetime, I, it always almost makes my heart twinge. Like, I, I feel like, no, I hope that's not true. I hope that was the beginning of a lifetime of trips. I really do. I think, you know, we learned so much that the next ones will even be better. 
So I would be happy to share that information again with well, people. I, think I look that, forward to it. I think what it. happens is that uh, we, we all get a little bit too comfortable with our busy lives. You know, I was just, while you were talking, I was thinking about, okay, how do I pull this off? You know, how do I right. tell my wife that um, we're not going to have any income for a year? How do right. I tell her that we're going to take the kids out of school? They're going to miss classes. They're going to miss tests. They're, you know, it could impact their grades, you know, yeah. homeschooling. And, and uh, you know, th- that sounds to me like a, you know, a, a very difficult sell, if you will. So I think that... Um, you know, uh, some of us are going to have to live vicariously through you. And what advice would you have for the the rest of us, the people who might want to try something like this, whether it's a, uh, you know, a, a trip modeled after what you've done or something completely different? Yeah, it's an interesting thing because you never want to come off as preachy about any of it, because I think any travel is valid. You know, anytime you get out of the safety of your studio or, you know, that routine of, you know, that envelops all of us especially if you've got kids and sports and everything else. But I really do believe that it was that travel and getting off the beaten path and reaching beyond our comfort levels and eating foods that we really had no idea and all these different things like that. It was just that getting beyond and stretching ourselves. And, you know, it's like any large goal that once you have accomplished it, you know, within weeks of getting home, we're like, okay, what's next? Yeah. What's our next big goal? And it was, just that idea that, you know, as a team, as a family unit, we were able to do this thing. I mean, we hiked Machu Picchu. We, I mean, so many things that I would have were so beyond things that I thought I could do. Um, and you know, thought I could do with my 11 year old daughter. Um, so I would just say it's that pushing, it's that trying new things and getting beyond. I, you know, for so many families, I think that a one month trip or even a two week trip, but just doing something that's not just going to the Hilton in Hawaii or, you know, Disneyland, but getting out and maybe getting involved with a small village or a community and getting getting to meet the people, I think would be so great for so many of us. So a personal question may be, may be an inappropriate question. <laughs> what do you think you spent on this for the whole year? You know what? I can actually tell you all of that with the help of my wife who is not here. She is a, um, she is a numbers person and we actually kept a very good spreadsheet. And, uh, so that's how I know, like we only stayed, you know, in about three hotels, 33% of our trip was spent with friends or family. So that really cut the prices down. Um, but I'm afraid I can't give you specific numbers, but it was, we, I think budgeted about a hundred and, $20,000 $20,000 and we came home with a huge chunk of that. We were able to actually, yeah, uh, fix up my studio, double its size. Um, we were, we had our basically 120,000 included our emergency funds and we came back with quite a bit and we were able to get back into our normal lives pretty quickly. My wife actually quit her job before we left and was able to, uh, get a get a job back um and uh so yeah we were very fortunate i'm not gonna say that it you know it would be easy for everybody but things for us really worked out okay and, so if if you're listening to this and this is something you want to do raise your hand right now uh, yeah <laughs> see almost everybody raised their hand you've done something that that i think most of the people listening to this uh, i think we're well over 40 or fifty thousand people who who get this now are, are saying, gee, I, you know, I need to do this. I, I think that what you've done is remarkable, Michael, and, and, and I would encourage you to give this thing wings, right? So you might be able to turn this into something so much bigger than what you've been able to do on your own by enlisting uh, other painters around the world to also try to do something else, to reach out to touch orphanages or to you know, to do something uh, worthy that's bigger than all of us, because uh, that you know that's the magic of this movement of plein air painters is that um, you know it's there's so much more to it than just going outside and painting. Yes, and you absolutely you've agree. Proven that. You know, I I I always you know I always marvel because I'll be setting up in a in a in a city somewhere and I'll be painting and some kid will walk up with with or without their parents usually with their parents. 
And I always hand them the paintbrush, and I say, okay, I ask the parents' permission. May I show them how to do this? And their eyes light up. You know, you take their little hand, and you, you show them a couple brush strokes, and then you say, just do it on your own, because I, I know they can't ruin my painting. <laughs> and uh, they light up. And then I say to the parents, you know, now here's what you need to do. If your kid seems interested in this, here's how you can get them some lessons or here's how you can get them started in this. Because I, th I think, you know, the think about the lives that you changed uh, because of exposing these kids to art. And, you know, you never know that that first experience of painting their self-portrait with a volcano might lead to them doing something phenomenal in their life with art. So you're to be commended for something very great and, and very wonderful. Wow. Well, thank you so much. It uh, means a lot to hear that from you. Thank you. I should also mention to the people who are listening, a, a lot of people knew you because you were on stage at the opening, oh, of, the, no. at the opening <laughs> of the Plein Air Convention when we did Plein Air Wars. You were uh, one of the people who was nominated and selected. And uh, for those who don't know, Plein Air Wars was essentially, we went on stage, uh, everybody had 30 minutes to do a painting, and uh, everybody, I would imagine, yourself included, kind of had something in mind of what you were probably going to paint on stage. Did you? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you did. And you were all getting ready to blow us away with your, your great skills, but we threw a last-minute kink into the thing and we went to the audience and we said throw out a subject and then another subject and then we each painter had to do a different subject and yours was what a dinosaur uh, or something no i had to do a bull on a snow mountain <laughs> snowy mountain <laughs> yeah <laughs> no immediate references in my head at the time yeah, yeah that well, was well, we like to surprise people. So that was a lot of fun anyway. I, I appreciate your, your courage on that and your willingness to have a lot of fun. I think everybody had a lot of fun with it. Well, I, uh, I will get on the horn and make arrangements. We'll get you on stage at the Plein Air Convention in, in uh, Santa Fe. I should mention that um, as of today, it's already almost, I think, 65 or 70 percent sold out, and there's many, many, many months ahead of us. So it's, um, it's going to be a terrific convention. Yeah, if I can give you a little plug there, I went to this last year, and I've been to most all of them, and every year better and more fun than the last. And this, I was, I bought that my tickets in the first uh, couple minutes. You offered it up, I was so excited. So, looking forward to it already. Well, terrific! It's it's a lot of fun, and um, you know what's what's great about it is we get the community together, and everybody gets to know each other. You get to see how others are approaching the same subject when you're all out there painting together. So. You mentioned earlier you had formed an organization called Studio Everywhere. How can people find out about it? How can they contribute? What ways can they participate? Great. Uh, we have a website, studioeverywhere.org, which is kind of our blog and information and uh, has some of the maps and places we traveled. And we would love, like you were saying, uh, you know, expanding this beyond ourselves and keeping it going. Um, and so we welcome anybody that's traveling and would like to be a part, even if it's just one country or one school or one orphanage, we welcome you uh, to join us at studioeverywhere.org and just send us some information. We'll be in contact and uh, we'd love to add your pictures to our website and uh, keep this moving. Well, Michael, this has been a phenomenal conversation and, and probably the most unique and interesting of, of, all because it's so different um, you have first off I'm very impressed with your painting you've become a fabulous painter but you have uh, you have a great heart and you've done something that's pretty remarkable so congratulations thanks again I really appreciate it thanks again to Michael Orwick what an amazing story we'll get Michael on stage at the Plein Air convention by the way you want to get your seats because it's growing and it's going to sell out fast we're already in the 60 or 70 percent sold out uh, and we've got many, many months to go. So that's next April. Today's interview was brought to you by Fall Color Week. Uh, it's the event that I do in Acadia National Park. It's coming up this October. Come paint with me for a week. Fallcolorweek.com. Also sponsored by easelbrushclip.com, where you'll find the cool tool for artists. www.easelbrushclip.com. 
Well, you know, the plein air movement is red hot, and that may be why plein air magazine remains the leader, the top representational art magazine sold nationwide at Barnes & Noble. Top art magazine. That is so cool. We're so proud of that, and thank you for making it happen. Drop by, pick one up at uh, Barnes & Noble or anywhere, and or get a bi-monthly subscription for about half the price you pay on the newsstand at plenairmagazine.com. This is always fun. I always learn a lot from all these painters. Uh, let's do it again sometime like next week. We will see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine, and this is the Plen Air Podcast. Remember, it's a big world out there, so go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.